Good morning, Journey. It's been a couple of weeks since I've been with you. It is really good to, to be here with you. How we doing? Wow. Okay. Stephen, Stephen I'm glad you're good, man. Uh, you and I can go tear it up, I guess. So this weekend, I was uh, hanging out in my house. I was uh, recovering from being with people all day. And um, my wife comes in. She's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm laying down. And she said, come out here with us. I said, oh, I'm hungry. It was 8.30. I hadn't had dinner. And she was like, well, I'll make you dinner and bring it over. And I was like, I'm not eating in front of people. Anyway, so she, she made me dinner. I ate it real quick. And she's like, I'm bringing you a chair. So I walked over uh, with a Diet Dr. Pepper in my hand and uh, joined her on the patio, the driveway of one of our neighbors. And they had music going and we just hung out and talked for a couple hours, just really good. And uh, we live in this little neighborhood that's, they actually have a private uh, Facebook messenger group called The Hood. <laughs> because it's just, the, we're invested in each other's lives. And it's really, really good. They got onto this topic because of the music selection that they had been playing. I didn't get to pick. By the way, uh, Jeff Holbert is WG's son. And Jeff, I want to let you know during this evening, I played about four of your songs. So I had to, sh I had to broaden them a bit. Uh, what's up, Z? Uh, and I just got distracted. <laughs> they, they were playing old country and they got onto this conversation about all these old country artists. And I have a confession. I didn't know what they're talking about. Like I, Chris and I, December will be 25 years that Chris and I've been married. And no, I was not 12 when we got married. Uh, there's no way that I would even have a clue what was going on in this conversation without being married to her. I literally, I, I knew about, I know that I had never heard of a, a fourth of the guys that they talked about. Maybe half of the other ones I heard only because of Kristen. Like, I knew who uh, Hank Jr. was, you know, I knew who Dolly Parton was, but beyond some of that stuff, I, I, I was clueless what was going on. How much of what we were raised in influences these kinds of things, right? Like, Kristen grew up with this old country thing in their house. I did not. I grew up with my parents lift, listened to old oldies rock. Like I grew up with, with Elvis and Buddy Holly and the Platters. Like I didn't even know what was going on in the 80s and 90s. I, I, was, I was back in the 70s, 60s and 70s. But how much of that family of origin influences how you think? Influences your priorities, what you, what you value. Because so much of how we, how we engage life goes way beyond silly things like our music taste, right? And as we become, move into maturity, there's some things that begin to, to happen. Like we get a level of ownership and control beyond our family of origin. 
as we move into maturity and my, my big kids are doing this now. Brady and Maya have been now married for a year and they have begun to set their own values and priorities. Many of them passed down from us, but some of them different. Reagan's in her second year of, of college and she's figuring those things out as well. Have you ever stopped to really evaluate what influences what you value? I'm gonna show my cards at the very beginning and tell you, we, we as a people are apprentices of Jesus. We are a people who, who learn from him a new way of life. We quite literally are a new humanity that functions differently. Have you ever just picked up the story and, and watched what Jesus did with people? You, you open the Gospels and the very first movements that Jesus does in, in, his, in his ministry is to call some people to what? To follow him. We get Peter and Andrew, James and John, and he, he turns and he says, come, follow me and I will make you fishermen, because that's what they were, of people. Because that's what I'm doing. And then you, you see him come to a tax collector's booth. A guy named Matthew, also called Levi, and he gives him the same call, like, follow He comes to a guy named Philip with the exact same, follow me. And every time he does this, what his expectation is in following is this, leave it all behind. Whatever you've got going right now, drop it. Let me show you a new way. Let me show you a new life. Follow me. Become my apprentice. The word that you'll see in scripture, in, in the gospels is disciple. And the closest word that we have in our English language to the word disciple is apprentice. It is someone who learns the way of their teacher, of their master, so much that they reproduce an exact same kind what their master, what their teacher did. We are apprentices of Jesus. And it's the reason why we use the language that we use here at Journey. We, we, you won't hear around here the word Christian very often, not because we don't like it, but because we think follower of Jesus describes much better, much more fully what it is that we're up to. We're following him into his way of life. At the end of Jesus' ministry in, in John chapter 13, Jesus turns to his disciples and he, he puts it this way. He says, a new command I, I give you. That doesn't sound very new. He, he talks about that all the time, but listen to what he says. He says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Do what I did. Follow me. And then he trumps it. He puts the exclamation on it. And he says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Translate, everyone that will know that you are my apprentices. Everyone will know that you are following me if you love one another because that's what I do.
John in 1 John puts it this way. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, he says, Whoever claims to live in him must live as he did, as Jesus did. The actual word there in the Greek, I don't like what the NIV did recently. They're trying to help us understand what he's talking about. But I like the language better in the original language. It says, whoever wants to, whoever claims to walk in him must walk as Jesus did. This idea of how you conduct yourself, this way of life looks like him. So, I ask the question, what influences how you think? What influences your priorities? What influences your values? At Journey, we have identified five very distinct, clear values that are taken from the heart and nature and character and teaching of Jesus that shape our life together. Because we are becoming people that look and think and act like him. Those values are these. Belonging before believing. We'll talk about that in a minute. Kingdom focused. Christ first. Biblical authority and transformation driven. Today, we're just going to do the first two. Belonging before believing. This is like where we start at Journey. We have a mandate that says that our our marching orders, our non-negotiable directive of who we are and what we're going to be about is walking with disconnected people. Like we are after people who are not connected to God or not connected to the people of God. And we live in that through belonging before believing. And the rest of our mandate says in transforming community, we'll talk about transformation driven as we become like Jesus. And it's what this whole conversation is about. Have you ever did, have you ever done an exhaustive look at who Jesus hung out with and who he, who he invited into his life? It is offensive to the religious. But it is life to apprentices of Jesus. Let me show you real quick. I already mentioned Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They were fishermen. They were the uneducated who lived in the northern part of Judea called Galilee, the place that was not someone, people, people, rabbis did not pick their apprentices from them. They were not equipped. They were not prepared. They were fishermen. And Jesus called them to follow. And again, they, he called them to become like him. But it gets so much better than that. I already mentioned Matthew as well. Like Matthew, the tax collector, the traitor to Israel. This guy who is getting rich off of extorting his own people in partnership with an occupying country. A tax collector who, if you speak to him and associate with him, you are unworthy now to associate with me. You could not go into his house and then go to worship. 
You could not hang out with him or talk to him. He was the enemy of his own people. Jesus says, follow me. And note, when he calls him, when he tells him to follow him, he is in his tax collector booth. He has not figured out his theology. He has not cleaned up his life. He is in the midst of his rebellion and acting it as he's talking to Jesus. And Jesus says, I want you. <laughs> what in the world is going on? And not only that, he doesn't just pull him out of the tax collector booth and clean him up and say, okay, let's do this thing. You're gonna, we're gonna swallow you up with the rest of my guys. No, Jesus follows him to his house and has a party with a bunch of other sinners. Had to pick my word there. And it is so offensive that the religious are like, what's going on? Belonging before believing is how Jesus did this. And then you get to women. Women, just look at women in the gospel story. They were marginalized in, our, in their society. They had no voice. They had no value. They were almost property. Not for Jesus. Not for Jesus. He elevates them. Do you know who funded Jesus' ministry? Women. Luke chapter 8, Mary Magdalene, a woman that Jesus pulled seven demons out of. Jesus is like, I want you. <laughs> they followed him around. Like there were women with the disciples. And they were funding the work, making sure that they ate. Not only Mary Magdalene, a woman named Joanna, the wife of Herod's household manager. Herod, the king, who was absolutely against everything that Jesus was trying to do. The wife of his household manager is funding Jesus' ministry. Jesus is like, I want you. And a woman we've, we don't know anything about. Her name is Susanna. She's part of it too. Remember the Samaritan woman? So Samaria, an area that is north of Jerusalem in the Judea area, that is in between Judea and Galilee, an area that is full of half Jews, half Gentiles that have intermarried and disgraced God, who ch worship what they don't understand and don't know, who have changed the, even the scriptures to fit what they want. Jews who would look at them and say, you are worse than an unbeliever. You are disgraceful. I can never associate with you. They would, when they would travel to Galilee, they would go through Judea and go around Samaria just so they wouldn't have to go through that area. Jesus goes intentionally through that area, sits at a well and hangs out with a woman who is so bad that she goes and draws water from the well when no one else will be there because even the other Samaritan women will not hang out with her. And he sits at a well and invites relationship with her and she is dumbfounded. But it gets even better than that. When she goes back she brings the village to him. Come see the man that knows everything that I've ever done. And they ask him to stay. Jesus hangs out 
with this Samaritan village belonging before believing for two days, eating with them, touching them, loving them. And it says many of them became believers. This is how Jesus does Belonging before believing. Maybe my, be- my favorite story about this is the one that we teach our little kids to sing about. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Y'all know that song? Hey! He climbed up in that sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. See, WG won't let me sing up here. It's another tax collector. He, Jesus is in Jericho and he's walking through the town and, and Zacchaeus hears that he's coming and he's short. He can't see over the crowd. But he's got to see Jesus. So he climbs this tree, and, and as Jesus is walking by, he, he sees this dude hanging out in a tree. And he knows him. He knows all about him. He knows who he is. He knows what he's done. He knows what he's about. And Jesus looks at him and he says, Hey, Zacchaeus, come on, man. I pick you. Like, of the entire town of Jericho, where Jesus chooses to go hang out. It's with him. I want to go to your house. And it's offensive to the religious. It's offensive because we're supposed to be holy people. And how can you, how can you be around someone who is like this? You're a teacher. But for Jesus, it's life-giving. And for apprentices of Jesus, it's life-giving. Belonging before believing. And you know the result of Jesus functioning like this in Zacchaeus' life? He turns and he says, Jesus, right here, right now, I give half of everything that I have to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will give, I will pay it back four times. That is the power of belonging before believing. When people are loved by God in a way that they can never deserve it, it transforms them. And they will experience that when we reflect him to them. When we find our neighbor in the tree and say, I want Hang out with you. So what does this mean for us? It means that we believe that belonging happens before believing, and therefore we will welcome anyone at any point along the journey of faith. It means we live in constant, constantly open to people looking for opportunities to to invite them into our life and invite them into our family. And as we do, we we don't expect them to clean themselves up and to get their theology right or to fix their lives in order for us to have relationship with them. We love them where they are. 
we welcome their questions. If you're new around here, your questions are okay. We have some too. And we'll figure that out together. And we empathize. We empathize with their struggle. Because we understand struggle. We've lived it. We've been the guy in the tree. And as we do, we make Jesus known in their midst. We trust his spirit and his love to do its thing. As Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse, verse 7, we plant, we water, God gives the increase. God's going to take care of the rest. And this fits very closely to our value number two, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love you well, and I'm going to fast forward this a little bit so that you're not here for another hour. But have you ever considered how focused on the kingdom Jesus was? Like, quite literally, it's, it's all he wanted to talk about. When he began his ministry... The very first thing that it says is Jesus started preaching his message. And what his message was in Matthew chapter uh, 4, verse 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. In Mark, Mark's version of it, he says this, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus in the gospels, Jesus taught directly, specifically, naming the kingdom 106 times. Like it's, it's his constant refrain. It is, it is what he is absolutely always focused on explaining and revealing to his followers. So, Right after he starts in, Matt, in Mark, when it says that he's preaching this, his repent for the kingdom of God is here. He spends all night healing at Simon Peter's mother-in-law's house. And then he escapes to go pray and kind of reset. And his, his disciples come and follow him. And they, they, they go to look for him and find him and, and say, Jesus, everybody's waiting on you. Come on back. We got more to do. Like people, it's working. And his response, his response is, let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also because that's why I've come. And what's he preaching about? He's preaching about the kingdom. This message has got to get out. Look at his parables. Nearly all of them start with, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like, just go look at him. He is, nearly all of his parables are explaining what this thing is. One of the most clear ones that helps us grab and wrap our minds around the kingdom is, is the parable of the soil. And to just sum it up, basically he says this, that the kingdom's growth in us is like the condition of the, of the soil that a farmer plants in. And when he plants in good soil, it accepts the seed and it grows to a hundred times what was planted. The kingdom of God will erupt in a heart that is open.
In Luke chapter 17, when, when he, Jesus was asked when the kingdom of God will come, his response is, is this. The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed or, or people will say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed king of God was in their midst and he was initiating the kingdom as he spoke. And he gives instructions for us about how to live in the kingdom right now. The disciples were walking down the road and they were arguing about who's going to be the greatest. And what that meant was who was going to be the greatest when Jesus enters his kingdom. Remember James and John asking for the right and the left? Like they wanted prominence in the kingdom. And Jesus turns and he says, anyone who wants to be first, read first in my kingdom, will be the very last and servant of all. And then he takes a little child and he says, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me doesn't welcome me, but the one who sent me. Like, prioritize this. And John, struggling with what that means, struggling with the application of this, he goes back into his memory bank and he's like, oh, well, Jesus, um, like, we saw a man who was casting out demons in your name, and he wasn't one of us, so we told him to stop. John makes this jump about who do we welcome, really? And Jesus' response is this. Do not stop him. For no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. Anyone who's not against us is for us. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah, because you belong to the king of the kingdom, will certainly not lose their reward. Jesus teaching about how we function with others in the kingdom of God is get over yourself. This is about me, not about you. It is about my name becoming known, not yours. Get over yourself. If they're not, if they're not tearing my name down, celebrate it. And there's a accompanying teaching of that with a parable of the weeds that we're going to close on today. Jesus said this. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like, like a man who went out and sold good seed in, in a field. And then the enemy came and, and he sold weeds in the field as well. And then the servants came to, to the, the master and they said, look, there are weeds growing up among the wheat. Do you want us to rip the weeds out? And Jesus said, the master turns and says, no. Because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them as well. Let both grow together. And at that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds, tie them up, throw them in bundles to be burned, and then go collect the wheat. What does this mean for us? It means that we believe that journey is only one expression of the much larger body of Christ. We are building his kingdom, not ours. 
and we will look to celebrate everything that is done in the name of Jesus, and we will partner where we can. We will actively look for other churches and other organizations that speak the name of Jesus and say, how can we help? Places where it's too much and the distance is too far, we will bless them and move on. we realize that we are not in competition with anyone who speaks the name of Jesus. That's God's work. Let him deal with this. But we will advance the kingdom everywhere we can. And we will plant churches outside of our own walls and multiply the kingdom that we will never touch because his kingdom needs to grow, not ours. What shapes what you value? My prayer is that it is Jesus. And that you read and discover his heart and seek and dependently beg for God to make you more like it. We want to invite you as a part of this family to join us in that. Belonging before believing and kingdom focused.